This is the third in a series on the book of Daniel, just as a real quick recap. Judah's been taken captive in the 586 or so BC era and carted off to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar is the conquering king. Nebuchadnezzar, strangely enough, is a Hebrew translation of the Akkadian. It means loosely that God Nebu or God Nebo save my firstborn son. That's Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel and his three friends, what are their names? Harry what? Harry what? No, no. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were included in the captives. In the first chapter was the first test. They, were not, they did not want to eat from the king's defiled table. They passed successfully, and God blessed them. The second test, under threat of death, with massive pressure, uh, Daniel and his friends called to God, and he translated the interpretation of the king's dream and of the image. And if you remember, the image of the four kingdoms. And King Nebuchadnezzar was pictured as the first kingdom, the head of gold. But that whole image was to be smashed by this mysterious stone that we interpret as the coming kingdom of God and Jesus Christ as Messiah. King Nebu, that's my abbreviation, King is beyond grateful. He promotes Daniel and his three friends to a high office, acknowledges their God, and he states, I quote chapter 2, the king answered and said unto Daniel, of a truth, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets. We now move to chapter 3. We shall see. The purpose of this message is to apply the concept, as we heard in one of the songs that we just sang, to a lesser or greater extent, and it can vary by the individual that's interpreting it, that we live in a type of Babylon, a different world system where we are expected to live appropriately, accordingly, by God's commands, and to respond appropriately, all the while living in Babylon. The title, with apologies to Chuck Swindoll, is called Pavlovian Babylonian Worship. Huh? I like that. It was on a, what is that, onomatopoeia or onomatopoeia pizza or something, some literary device. In the 1890s, Russian psychologist Ivan Pavlov, how many of you ever heard of Pavlov? Whoa! Okay, good. This will be easy. Just to remind you then, Ivan Pavlov was researching dogs in response to being fed. He measured their saliva. Boy, this was a... a a career-shaping uh, course for you that you took that you received all this. So he measured the saliva when the dogs were indeed fed. Pavlov predicted the dogs would salivate in response to this being fed when the food was placed in front of them. But he noticed that his dogs would begin to salivate whenever the footsteps of his assistants, assistants were heard while bringing the food, before the food even got there. He continued his research and tested a variety of other neutral stimuli which would otherwise be unlinked to the receipt of food. These included precise tones produced by a buzzer, the ticking of a metronome, and etc. those related. And when they heard the sound before the food, they reacted. They had become conditioned to associate certain sounds with the expectation of food. It's called a Pavlovian response. In other words, training begets a conditioned response automatically. I was thinking about what this is like in our culture. It's kind of like just before Thanksgiving or around Thanksgiving, all of a sudden, can you hear me okay up there? You start to hear Christmas music, Christmas music, and people, atheists, agnostics, non-religious people, Christmas music, buy things, go to Amazon, buy things. It's a conditioned response. It's Pavlovian, it's amazing. A question for you is, are we conditioned the same in similar ways. And with that, we'll see that this is very much borne out in chapter 3 of Daniel. So turn there if you would, please. This, among all the, the chapters in Daniel, is a fascinating one. It's fascinating because it has some highly, highly repetitive phrasing and word structure. It is truly amazing. You'll see one particular phrase that we'll, we'll note is used nine times in this chapter alone. Another phrase is used 13 times in this chapter. It's done repetitively for reasons that uh, I think are myriad. But as we read this, I'd like you to keep chapter 2 in mind. Ca chapter 2 in mind and the image uh, on the four kingdoms. 
So and especially the stone that would bring it all down. We are not told how long between chapter 2 and chapter 3 is. We don't have a time. But King Nebuchadnezzar, throughout his career as the Babylonian leader, he was a very, very successful king. In fact, in some campaigns over much of his career, he did not lose. Ask the children of Israel, children of Judah. And so we'll begin this victorious leader. Chapter 3, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. He set it up, catch that phrase, he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, see the repetition here. The treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Very good. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So, get the picture. This image has been created. This image of gold. Wow. Sounds a little similar to chapter 2, right? We'll see about Nebuchadnezzar and his memory. Chapter 2 must have taught him well. But there's more. He assembled his entire government before this huge image. Note that these phrases are repeated. Had set up is over and over again. By the way, it's nine times. Had set up. Don't, don't count it now, please. Just trust me. The image is estimated at some 80 to 90 feet tall. It was probably overlaid with gold. It wouldn't be solid gold. This might, you might find this interesting. It's a very quick fact. All the gold mined in human history, do you know what it could fit inside of? Cubic, the cubic form, a baseball diamond. Less than 90 feet squared, about 21.4 meters cubed for the math geniuses. That's all the gold that's been mined in the entire history of mankind. I see some frowny faces. Yeah, I know, you'd think by watching TV there's probably a thousand times that amount of gold in the world. N no, it, there just isn't. And so this is probably overlaid, and we're not sure as to whether this was an image of the god Nebo his god, Nebuchadnezzar, or Nebuchadnezzar himself, and it's really rather immaterial. So this, this image, this image of gold, it's big, it's huge. And all are assembled for this proclamation. And here comes the proclamation. Verse 4, then a herald cried, he said, to you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, languages, that at the time you hear the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony, with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning furnace. That's called threat. So at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and symphony, with all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshiped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had Set up. Add set up. So, he gives them a pro proclamation. When you hear the music, you drop, you kneel, you worship. And that's exactly what they did. Obviously, there was a threat. If you don't, we throw you into a fiery furnace. So we would call this Pavlo Pavlovian conditioning with force. So let's try it. I asked my wife if I could borrow her flute. Um, other... Among other things, she said, you must be kidding. So I did some research. And when I read the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony, I mathematically, kinesiologically, assembled the exact sounds that these instruments would produce. All right, you ready? It's music to a three-year-old, I know. Why would you laugh when the Babylonians heard that? They dropped to their knees and worshiped the golden image. You obviously have not been conditioned properly. <laughs> but we are indeed, in fact, conditioned already, aren't we? Babylon has already conditioned us. It's conditioned us, conditioned us in simple ways, complex ways, ways that we probably don't even realize it conditions us to respond and to react inappropriately, incorrectly, 
probably each and every day. We do not see debate anymore in the marketplace or on TV or in our newspapers, in any of our media, we see highly charged argumentation. It's fun to watch, isn't it? And a lot of you are nodding. What's interesting is a lot of you young people are nodding right now. This is sad. It's very sad. They argue. Society tells us to react this way. Even religious people are drawn into this. It's called self-righteous. But the youth have a word for it. Do you know what it is? It's called, the term today is called, you've been triggered, like on a gun. You've been triggered. You and me and all of us have Babylonian conditioning. What triggers you and me is the question. In Daniel, in Daniel, this is exactly what has happened. They were told by the governor of the time, here's the image, when you hear this music, you will fall down and you will worship the image. If you don't, we'll kill you. We'll throw you into this fire. So let's continue. Verse 8. Therefore at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, king, made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the <laughs> horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And indeed he did do that didn't he? We've heard it four times. He did say that. Here comes the best part. And you also said, oh yeah, whoever falls down and who does not fall down in worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Well, O oh king, bad news, bad news. There are, I love this phrase, certain Jews. Certain Jews, oh by the way, that whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, mainly set over whom? Them. The Chaldeans in this, this section are considered to be some of the, the more nobler class. Uh, these men, O oh great king, of uh, that you set up over us, these Jews, they do not do this. You've set them over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Oh, by the way, their names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, let me tell you what it would sound like a little bit in Chaldean, translated. Uh, these are the people that you, you named, O oh king. The commander of God, Aku. Also, who is great as Aku? Slave of Nebu. That's what their names mean in Akkadian. These are the names they've been given by the Babylonian king. So this just sinks in all the more deeply to King Nebuchadnezzar you can imagine who they're blaming for this. You can imagine who they're indirectly accusing of this problem. They're blaming Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, by the way, they're over there. So he says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not paid due regard to you like we do. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up like we do. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar could have responded Oh, yes, I remember chapter 2. They worship this mighty God that interpreted my dream. I remember that last chapter. Don't you guys? You were there. Remember what I said? No, he didn't say that. Babylon has the memory of a sieve. Verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, in some of your translations, it still will say he got angrier upon angry. He is enraged. He gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you have not served my gods or worshipped the gold image which I have set up? Now, now, he's going to give him a break. Now, if you are ready, at the time you hear the sound of the... Well, I promise this is the last time I'll do that. Once you hear the sound, Nebuchadnezzar says, of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But, 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 there's always a but. There's always a but. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. <laughs> and by the way, I love this phrase. Who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Who would 
deliver you from my hands. What God will save you? Well, we would answer, the God from chapter 2, that's who. You were there. You were in it. He doesn't remember. Even though the king gives them another chance, he does not remember. And the reasons we can learn from this lesson, Babylon does not remember because they really don't care to remember. It just isn't that important. Babylon expects God's people to prove themselves repeatedly, and they will give you challenge after challenge. I know of folks who have worked at a job for 20 to 30 years, and every fall they have to do what? Remind them they need the feast days off. Happened to me. Every year goes by, it's a new ball game. They don't remember. It's just not that important. It's incons they're inconsistently irregular. And we should be very much, as we heard in the first message, the exact opposite. It is unfair. It is going to get a whole lot more unfair. And we should be very wary of belittling them or ridiculing them, aside from the fiery furnace that some of us may be put to. But Daniel is a story about those perspectives of how do we respond. So let's look at the three men's response. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Please note the words they use. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, O Nebuchadnezzar, O Nebo, save my firstborn son. That's what it means in Akkadian. O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, what you've just said, if that is the matter, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery service, furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. Notice that. He will deliver us from your hand, O king. Verse 18. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Note the brevity of the response. Their lives are on the line. Possibly the furnace is within earshot or seeing it. We notice their respect. Their respect. O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, O oh, king. We also notice their incredible faith. He says God can deliver us. And he will somehow. But if not from this, we will not serve the other gods, period. Verse 16 does deserve a little attention. They weren't refusing, but it implies they need no defense. Possibly were they referring to the past, the prior event with, with Nebuchadnezzar and the image of the kingdoms and how he had had his dream interpreted. If that's what they were referring to, it could very easily. We're not going to debate it with you. We're not going to argue with you about it. You know how we feel, and that's that. So do what you will, we will be delivered. It's a power example of not only faith, but trust and tremendous resolve. They were not defiant, they did not yell, they did not attack, they did not plead, they did not beg. They knew, he knew, that they knew who was in charge? On verse 18, Gleason Archer in his Daniel commentary says, Scripture, quote, Scripture contains few more heroic words than, but even if he does not, even if God does not save him, he says there are few words in the entire Bible more heroic. If you recall, just from your memory, Genesis chapter 22, when Abraham is sacrificing Isaac, there's a similar echo. No matter what happens, Abraham says, God will provide a lamb. God will provide. In fact, that's exactly what he names the place. What's the lesson? Whereas we may, and hopefully you have not, be faced with exactly this type of fiery furnace, Paul states that we have not, not Paul Shemeth, the Apostle Paul, Paul states that we have not suffered unto blood or death in Hebrews 12. Ford comments on this, the commentary. As Daniel before them had been courteous in his request to follow his convictions, these three acknowledged King Nebuchadnezzar was king, but their ultimate allegiance was to the king of kings. 
Indeed, we, all of us in this room, have, have endured our little fiery trials, some larger than others, some smaller than others, and some, it seemingly, there's fires every week. We have our own little furnaces. But if we look back, and I think that's exactly what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were doing, they knew exactly they could very well be delivered because they had been before, just as you and I. We'll look back, God will provide. Some way, somehow, and sometimes in a way that we had no idea that way was possible. It wasn't quite our idea. That's not exactly what we prayed for, but God got it done nonetheless in his time. Let's continue in verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. He gets mad a lot. In fact, his, the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Abednego. He is furious, furious. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. That's a lot. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor, big guys. You know, can you imagine just these guys with their armor and their helmets and their, their Babylonian accoutrement? These guys are big, certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Now that's been heated seven times more. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans. That's interesting. I mean, get the visual picture here. They're in Babylonian garb in their other garments and were cast clo fully clothed into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Do you realize what that does? Guess what burns first? Yeah, the clothing on them. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound to the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. It's a horrible, horrible, horrible scene. King Nebuchadnezzar is furious. His face changes at them. They heat the furnace sevenfold. Now, we can imagine possibly a, a large ceramic or brick kiln, if you know what a kiln is, just like a big, big oven that obviously people could, could walk into. That's how big it is. And he heats the furnace seven hold, sevenfold. So let's dig a little bit. I did some research. I'm familiar with gas, glass and ceramic firing, but let, let me give you some numbers. Glass fires typically, approximately, at 1,300 degrees Fahrenheit. You thought, where is he? You thought it was hot up here. It's not hot up here. Where did he, Mr. Mr. Frankie go? Anyway, oh, up in the third heaven. Oh, there you are. So it ain't 1,300 degrees Fahrenheit up here. Ceramic fires approximately 2,100 degrees Fahrenheit. How about flesh? How about flesh? A burning feeling on the skin is at 111 degrees Fahrenheit. First degree burns are at 118, 118. Second degree burns at 131 degrees Fahrenheit. At 140 degrees Fahrenheit, pain receptors in the skin are overloaded and they become absolutely numb to any pain. At 162 degrees Fahrenheit, human tissue is destroyed on contact. Extreme point of reference, bodies are cremated at 1400 to 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. So possibly if they started at 200 to 300 degrees Fahrenheit, enough to warm a good pizza, it ended up north of 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit, enough to cremate. And that's exactly what it did to the mighty men of valor from Babylon. I can relate in a small way. Small way. I'll tell you a quick story. I have some experience here. Two years ago, about two days before the Day of Atonement, I was trying to light a small fire in our little fire pit out in the backyard. I know this is going to end really, really badly. So match after match had failed on the little pieces of paper and wood that I had there. So being resourceful, I had my fuel oil gas mixture blower not too far away. Yes, that's right. I unscrewed the cap and took the napalm-like oil gas mixture and poured it on top of the pit. Little did I know that one of the matches had lit down below. I didn't see it. And so as the gas fuel mixture went down, the flame went up right into the blower and my hand that was holding the blower. Yes, this, this is not good. I was in the backyard and Becky was in the kitchen. I didn't know exactly where and I yelled out, honey, honey. 
and, and she's so caring. I don't think she saw me. I know she didn't see me till later. And she said, okay, don't make a mess. <laughs> so she was busy. I got it. So I tried not to make a mess. So I waved my hand to blow out, and my hand was on fire. Well, when you wave gas oil, I scattered it all over chairs, cushions, plants. It, it was quite impressive. <laughs> there was little fires everywhere. I looked at my hand. I said, this, isn't, this is not good. This is not good. And I got some pretty bad burns out of it. Thankfully, my wife did come out, and she bandaged me up. I won't repeat what she said. Uh, but she got me fixed up. In fact, a couple of ladies here uh, during the Feast of Tabernacles went on to the Feast of Tabernacles. And I, I have no scarring. May God be thanked in heaven above. So let me tell you, flesh begins to char at about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. I'd like to know what these three men were thinking. Seriously. As they prepared to enter that fiery furnace. What were they talking about? What was going through their minds? We're, we are not told. But predicated on past chapters, they probably discussed this situation very briefly, as they did before with one another. And they prayed as they did with one another. I'd love to know what it was. And then came the miracle. Verse 24, please. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. Now remember, he's, he's watching, obviously, from a very safe distance. King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke to the people around him and saying to his counselors, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? He says, or they, said, they answered and said to the king, true, O king. Look, king answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the son of God. Now, his memory may be a sieve, but he can count. Didn't we put three in there? Three? One, two, three? There's four. And one of them doesn't quite look human. Now, the various translations you may have in your Bible will be similar to son of, son of, God, son of the gods, or one like the son of the gods, or a son of God. In the Septuagint, it's very, very clear. That's the Greek translation, which is older than the Masoretic text. The Greek Septuagint is clear. It is Son of God, without the article adjective. So who was this Son of God? Who was this individual who's not quite human? We'll see, because things begin to accelerate very, very quickly. Verse 26, Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace, not too close, and spoke and he yells out saying, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. <laughs> Notice this response. He learns, he forgets quickly, but he learns very quickly. He says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the most high God, come out. I imagine he said, please, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire. The satraps, the administrators, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. Their hair on the head, the hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not of them. How many of you have ever had a small fire or a large fire, been in a fire in your home or whatnot? Ever been to a fire? What's the problem after you put it out? The smell. Smoke gets into every crevice you can imagine. They had no smell. So, sounds like a small issue. It's not. They weren't affected in any way. The smell of fire was not on them. Verse 28. Verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were saved by the angel of God, God's, God's angel. Nebuchadnezzar saw three go in. A fourth appeared. As they exited the oven, the furnace, three came out, not four. This non-human entity was in the fire, then not in the fire. 
And sent, it says that God has sent his angel. Who would that angel be? Their God had delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the verse that God had sent his angel, his malek, ankelos in Greek, is one of 20 to 30 references in the Old Testament that we have discussed in this church many, many times in the past. Abraham, Jacob, Hannah, Gideon, Moses, and now these three, the God has, that God has sent one like the Son of God, his angel, to deliver his people. This person we know is Jesus Christ because this book has continuity with this individual, as we'll see later in this book, as we have prior in this book. It is an anthropomorphic appearance, a deliverer who represents God in his agency, God the Father. And again, we will see this very clearly in, in a later theme in the book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar realizes for the second time that it is this God. Notice his response. Notice his response. Oh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, verse 26. Servants of the Most High God. He got religion real quick. He remembered real quickly what they had said to him. This is who we serve. And this he realized immediately. This is who has delivered them. God and his angel have frustrated the king's word, thwarted the king, his own words, in fact. It again proves that this stone of chapter 2 that destroys the image of the four kingdoms, the stone who we know is Christ, will destroy all kingdoms for chapter 2's image. It will eventually frustrate this king, Nebuchadnezzar, and all others. The result, they indeed should serve and worship only this God. We then close out this chapter with how chapter 2 ends in many ways. In verse 29, Nebuchadnezzar sees the error of his follies. He recognizes the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he says, therefore, I make a decree. Kings love to make decrees. I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces their houses shall be made an ash heap because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Notice the similarity, and you can read the end of chapter 2. By the way, he loves to destroy people. That, you know, his chosen form of, of death, his favorite punishment is tearing offenders apart with trees. That's what the, the tearing apart, and he loves to make them, their homes an ash heap. This seems to be a, a Babylonian thing. And he promotes the men again. I have a question for you, just as a side question. Where's Daniel? Where's Daniel in all this? Interesting. We really have no answer where he is. It would be raw speculation. I know people love to speculate. We just don't know. Was he too high up to, to be part of this observance? Was he away on a trip? Uh, was he sick? Uh, what do we know for sure? We know for sure if he was there he'd have been thrown into the furnace, don't we? So the king recognizes the power of God. He decrees that no one is to gainsay this God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He again threatens with his favorite punishment, and he promotes the three. Conclusion, what does this teach us? This is not a long chapter, but there's far, probably very few children. It's one of the few stories I learned uh, when I was in Bible class. I think I was in it twice. And this is one of the stories of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. It's very well known. Very well known. What does it teach us? Roy Anderson, in his commentary unfolding Daniel's prophecies, he states, when they, the, 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 the young men from Judah, when they arrived in Babylon, the king changed their names, but he could not change their devotion to the living God. They were members of a conquered race. And when they appeared before Nebuchadnezzar, they were standing before the conqueror, the king. Yet they were themselves unconquerable. Rationalization is easy. We all do it. We're ashamed sometimes when we do it. But a simple bowing before the image, would that have been that big a deal? I mean, after all, they were going to kill you if you didn't do it. How about just a, a tiny bow, a little bow? I don't know. It's an individual thing. And each one of us has our own furnace to go through. 
But for these three, it was a very easy answer. The answer was no. Especially when everybody else does it. When everybody else does it, nobody wants to stand out in a crowd. And these three were standing out, obviously, in a crowd. Everyone else did. The music played, everyone bowed, everybody worshipped. The Babylonian, Pavlovian, Pavlovian, the Babylonian Pavlovian response was probably not a one-time issue. It probably had happened repeatedly. It was then the Chaldeans said to Nebuchadnezzar, these three Jews. Eventually they were found out. The question is, how do we respond and how we react? In the first message you heard today, you were given some pointers about how to react, to how to keep focused. But how and what triggers you? What triggers me? What is it that so easily is mentioned? Not a golden image, just anything. And you react. And you're justified in your reaction, just like I am. We call it self-righteous. You notice what they didn't do. They didn't go into a long explanation. They didn't enter into a debate. First Peter says, in four, chapter 4, verse 12, First Peter 4, 12 says, if you want to turn there, I'll read it to you. It says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. It's not a strange thing. If we had enough time and services today, we could ask five people come up. Five people. Young, old, wherever you came from, doesn't matter. And you'd be able to tell quickly this group of people the fiery furnaces that you have gone through. It's not something strange. Verse 13, but rejoice to the extent, as much as possible, that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when glo his glory is revealed, that you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Paul, in fact, relates this very event in Daniel in Hebrews chapter 11, which is the faith chapter. He says, through faith, these faithful ones conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, we'll get to that later, and quenched the power of fire. In fact, there's two references, if you catch it, to the book of Daniel. Stop the mouths of lions to be, and quench the power of fire, Daniel 3. It's really the issue, I think, in a lot of ways. There's two responses here. And we heard about it, and in fact, I tried to count the messages that we've heard about response. There are two in this particular instance of Daniel 3. The physical reaction and the verbal reaction. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, which is their real names, the names that we did not hear at all in Daniel chapter 3, their real names, they responded twice, didn't they? First response was not bowing down upon the music and worshiping another god. That was the first response. It was action. The second was their verbal response. Both were very, very brief. In fact, their physical response was what they didn't do, not what they did do. It was the lack of performance. They were brief, they were concise, and they were profound. They, again, did not enter into a long, drawn-out discussion. You'll notice how many verses, booklets, scrolls, maps, charts, that they presented to King Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, if your life's going to be on the line, you've got to start pulling the stuff out. Nope. They didn't in this case. And I'm not saying that's wrong, because there's other instances that we can point to in the New Testament where exactly they, they did just that. But here they did not. They didn't need them. Oh, by the way, they didn't have them. Everything that they learned, they didn't say, don't, Nebuchadnezzar says, while we capture these guys, let me make sure that they are allowed to take their temple scrolls. No, they got out with the clothes on their back. That's all they had. They had what was here and what they had here. So all they brought with them was their faith and their heart. But it is driven, as ours is, as theirs is, by a belief in a great God and his son, Jesus Christ, both of whom I believe are mentioned here in chapter 3. This chapter of Daniel should remind us how often we too have faced some type of of furnace, some type of trial by fire, 
or some, often, just some stupid conflict in our life that just isn't worth the reaction. How often we have been faced with this and how often God, often through his son, Jesus Christ, has pulled us out of the flames. It could have been, for the 30th time, I'll say it, it could be a small fire to someone else. It could be a very large fire for you. It could be, in fact, in some cases, a real fire, an honest-to-goodness, flesh-consuming fire. It should also remind us that whatever God does, and sometimes he doesn't do what we want him to do in the way we want him to do it, he just doesn't seem to listen. He gets us out of it, but he does it in a way that is pleasing to him. It's a way that God decides, and we're good with that. I'm good. I'm good with the result. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or better Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they're good with it, no matter what happens. Somehow, some way, they said, God will deliver us. So it, should, it is the way that we should allow God to train us, to condition us, to perfect us. As Daniel 3, its chapters have shown us, also one thing is to express gratefulness. To express gratefulness when God does deliver us. It should be, in fact, the first thing that we do. The very first thing that we do is say thank you. So that's our reaction to this Babylonian world. It needs to be God-conditioned. It's Pavlovian. 